Okay, well, it's seven o'clock, so I think we should get started. You ready there, Nick? Yep, yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, um, let me just get people muted here. Okay, welcome everyone to our first online training session since this whole uh, shutdown began. Thank you for joining us. I'm seeing quite a few names from other divisions, so welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna Stefik. I currently serve as the divisional superintendent in Victoria. When I'm not at St. John, I work as a paramedic for the ambulance service. Um, just before we start, a few housekeeping notes. Um, everybody should be muted and their videos off. I will be kind of controlling that. If you have questions or anything, there is a chat function. For me, it's right down here on the bottom of my screen. You can type your questions in there. If anything comes up during the lecture, questions, you can type it in here before you forget, and I'll be keeping track of questions. We'll do an answer period after next lecture. Um, if you have a question that you want to discuss, we can also unmute you and turn on your camera if you so choose. Um, I think that's about everything. So why don't we get started? Nick, should I let you introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Okay. I, have a, I have a slide for that. All right, oh. I'll get out of here then. <laughs> let me now figure out why it doesn't want to advance slides. There we go. Um, so, hi guys, welcome. Uh, this is a bit of an unusual way to deliver uh, regular St. John training. Uh, so I hope you guys will bear with me as, or bear with all of us as we sort of figure out, uh, figure out what's going on and how to do this best. Um, as I think Anna and everyone's mentioned already, uh, tonight's, uh, tonight's topic is infections and sepsis. And more specifically, well, now I've already broken something as I was trying to drag it around. Um, uh, more specifically, how do we recognize, uh, assess, and manage infections and sepsis in a pre-hospital environment or first aid environment? Um, no, that doesn't want to advance. There we go. Uh, so who am I? Uh, my name is Nick Hume. I'm a primary care paramedic with BC Ambulance Service. Uh, I'm currently stationed in Victoria, but I've worked uh, all over the South Island and Metro Vancouver for the last eight years or so. Um, I'm a provincial staff officer with St. John Ambulance, I'm sort of attached to Division 176, which is where I've done the vast, vast majority of my work with the organization. I've been kicking around here for about nine years now. Um, and I have a bunch of other boring academic qualifications uh, that don't really mean much today, but I, I'm sort of a semi-professional nerd. Um, there's a fantastic photo of myself there um, for you to see what I look like. Um, so infections and sepsis. Oh, and pardon me, just to reiterate what Anna said as well, if anyone has questions uh, while we're going, please feel free to put them into the typed in chat. And Anna's going to be uh, collecting and curating questions so that they can all sort of come at the end. Um, and I assume, Anna, if anything like really pressing comes up, feel free to cut in if it really seems like it's worth it. Um, I understand that there have been a number of folks that have had questions about uh, COVID-19 and some of the medical background behind that. I am by no means an expert in that field, but we are uh, we are happy to take some questions and uh, do what we can to answer them for the membership uh, after we've done all the sepsis questions. So we'll do infections and sepsis first, and then if people want to hang around for a little bit of COVID Q&A, we, uh, we can make that happen as well. So we're going to break tonight's talk into a few different sections. We're going to talk about what is an infection, right? And most people probably know this one, but it's, it's helpful to make sure that we're all on the same page with the same definition. We're going to talk about when does an infection become sepsis? Like what's the difference between infection moving into sepsis? Uh, we're going to talk about how to recognize the difference between those two in the field. And this is actually going to be the lion's share of what we're talking about tonight. Um, you know, there's not going to be a huge amount that we can do to actually provide treatment for the stuff in the field, but recognizing who needs to go to a doctor and who's okay to go home uh, is really uh, the biggest thing that we need to take away from this. Um, so we're going to talk about management. 
and um, we're going to save questions until the end. And again, COVID questions as well. So what's an infection? What's the big scary thing in the picture? An infection, and I've, I've picked uh, as well, by the way, guys, I've picked a couple of different uh, sources for definitions for this. Some of them are from common sources or, or um, um, uh, lay sources like the dictionary and uh, quite a few are from academic sources, but I, I particularly like this one from Merriam-Webster's. Uh, an infection is the state produced by the establishment of one or more pathogenic agents, such as a bacteria, protozoans, or viruses. Uh, in or on the body of a suitable host. Uh, I think it's probably reasonable to guess that most, if not all of us, have had some type of infection before, whether it's a cut finger or a scraped elbow or something like that, or whether it's, uh, whether it's a respiratory infection or a UTI or whatever. But mo most of us are familiar with this process. A large majority of the time, our body's immune system is able to, uh, to to heal ourselves. Things don't progress to the point of being a problem. So you get a you get a bit of a localized infection in your finger. You maybe get some pus coming from the moon, some purulent discharge. Uh, if you, it hurts a little bit, it gets red and hot as there's an inflammation process. And a few days later, it gets better and everyone's fine. If infection progresses and worsens we end up with something called disease. And uh, disease is defined by the NIH, the National Institute of Health in the US, as an infectious disease, uh, as a disease that is caused by the invasion of a host by agents whose activities harm the host tissues, that is, they cause disease, and can be transmitted to other, other individuals, that is, they are infectious. The term infection and disease are not synonymous, and this is really important. An infection results when a pathogen invades and begins growing within a host. Disease results if and only if and when as a consequence of the invasion of growth of pathogen tissue function is impaired. So you get that infection, it doesn't really do much and it goes away on its own. You didn't have a disease, you had an infection that your body spontaneously cleared. Um, if that infection stays, if it worsens, if it starts to impact your body's function and how we define impact can change a little bit, uh, it starts to become a disease process as well. Uh, so what are pathogens? We're talking about pathogens as well. What are some pathogens that we can uh, that we can identify as things that will cause or result in infection and disease? This is very strange for me too, by the way, guys, because I uh, this is one of those moments where I would normally pull the classroom to, to try and pre-answer my slide. And I can't do that right now, or I could, but it'd be very, very cumbersome. So um, I want you guys to think about this stuff. Um, pathogens. Pathogens, the most common ones that we're familiar with are bacteria and viruses, right? Those are probably the two most common things. Bacteria are whole-celled organisms, right? Viruses are protein strands, very complex protein strands that, that hijack our cells, our own internal cells mechanisms to replicate. And then in the less common realm, the stuff we're not gonna really talk too much about tonight, other than mentioning them on the slide, uh, is pro, uh, fungi, so you can get fungal infections. Um, protozoans, um, specific types of uh, specific types of microorganisms that often live in uh, in different environments, water, um, in the ocean, that sort of thing. Uh, helminths and parasites. So parasites are uh, things like malaria is actually a parasite, believe it or not. Uh, helminths are things like uh, bed bugs, lice, other forms of mites. They're things that will cause a disease process, but they're not necessarily what we maybe typically think of as a pathogen because they are self-sufficient organisms in their own right as well. And then prions. And prions, again, are things that we're not going to talk too much about tonight, but uh, they're probably the most well-known uh, well prion disease is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, uh, sometimes known as mad cow disease. It's a specific type of protein that doesn't quite even meet the definition of a virus, but will still replicate in an uncontrolled manner and cause uh, cause disease. Again, the things we're talking about tonight, the things that we see the most, especially in a pre-hospital environment, bacteria and viruses, right? So what can pathogens infect, right? And we're going to talk about this. This is the next slide. This is where I would pull the class, and uh, I can't do that right now. So I want you guys to think about what can pathogens infect. Pathogens can infect the surface of your skin, right? Uh, pathogens can get under your skin, they can infect wounds, they can infect your skin itself, they can infect, infect specific tissues and organs, and they can infect, in some cases, whole systems. Um, 
you know, you can have uh, you can have pathogens that will infect uh, significant portions of or all of your gastrointestinal tract or your genital urinary tract, for example, your urinary tract. Right. Uh -huh. So the topic of tonight's talk. When and how does an infection become sepsis? And then how do we go on to recognize and differentiate that in the field? So when does an infection become sepsis? Again, we've all had these infections. We've all had cuts and scrapes. We've all had cough, colds. Most of us have had the flu at some point. We've all had the sniffles. Um, you know, what's the difference between that and what we talk about when we talk about sepsis? I don't have this up on a slide, by the way, but sepsis kills about a quarter million people a year, like 250,000 people a year die of sepsis. So this is clearly not a, uh, you know, just a scrape on the finger or a UTI or a cough cold that has gotten out of hand. So what's the difference? Well, um, a guy named Gower, who wrote a whole bunch of stuff uh, in academic journals on sepsis, has defined, uh, uh, or sorry, pardon me, the first definition is Merriam-Webster, defining sepsis as a toxic condition resulting from the spread of bacteria or their toxins or viri from a focus of infection. And then Gower goes on to define sepsis as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. So what, is, what does that mean? That's a whole bunch of, it sounds kind of complex. Basically, when you have an infection that gets out of hand beyond your body's ability to, uh, to control it, your body's ability to actually fight off the infection, and that infection gets so big that either the infection itself or the byproducts of the infection, the toxins that it might be producing, um, start to cause dysregulation in your own body. So your body starts to run into problems with being able to function because it's so busy being infected. Okay. What's septic shock? Septic shock. Think about that for a sec. So we have, se we have a definition for sepsis, right? Septic shock. Again, this is a Gower. I used a lot of Gower in this. Um, septic shock is defined as sepsis with circulatory cellular and metabolic dysfunction that's associated with a higher risk of mortality. So again, lots of big words, lots of medical, blah, 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 blah. Um, what that really is saying is that septic shock is when sepsis, this broader infection process um, that has dysregulated, it's sort of exceeded your body's immune system's capacity to control it, has spread everywhere. When it turns into septic shock, it's when it starts to impact your circulatory system. And as we all know, the circulatory system is very, very important. That's how your body gets oxygen from your lungs all the way to everywhere else in your body and how it gets rid of all your other metabolic waste processes, notably carbon dioxide and many other things as well. Um, sepsis is, could also be something that involves cellular or metabolic dysfunction. So sepsis can actually cause chemicals that this infection will get out of hand to a point where uh, your, your actual cellular metabolism, your cells transfer of, of energy and waste products and your metabolism, the use of energy and waste products, um, get impaired by the disease process. It's important to note, by the way, and this is a common, uh, I think a common misconception, but really fast just to cover it. Um, a lot of people think of, of infections and diseases as things that want to or are trying to kill you. Um, you know, there's, it, it's important to remember that a good virus has selective evolutionary pressure on it to not harm or not significantly harm its, its host in ways that don't help propagate the virus or the pathogen, right, or the bacteria or the pathogen or the fungi or whatever, whatever the pathogen happens to be. Um, and it's important to, to, to realize that, that we all have many, many infections that are completely benign uh, that we're all running about with on, on a pretty regular basis, either because our immune systems are just doing a great job of handling them, or because they don't actually cause any dysfunction for us. Dysfunction for us, pardon me. Um, so, you know, do try to remember that. Do try to try to recognize that, that you know, um, infection that turns into disease, that turns into sepsis and then septic shock is, is not necessarily the norm. We do have lots of other, uh, lots of other microorganisms uh, with us as well. So some common sources of the origin of sepsis. So the things that we see, and I've, I've, I've curated this list a little bit to, to try and bring this list down to um, 
down to the things that we are most common or most likely to see, or at least be aware of in a pre-hospital environment. Uh, and again, you know, that, that includes, I know we have a lot of paramedics on the line right now, but that includes like in a first aid setting, in a paramedic setting, anywhere where we don't have access to lab work, basically. Um, what are the things that we're most likely to see as origins of sepsis? Where do these infections or what parts of the body do these infections come from? The reason as we go through these, the reason this is important is that thinking about these things can help give you some ideas about questions and history taking questions to ask your patient to try and figure out if you're dealing with a sepsis or if you're dealing with another, uh, another disease process. And we'll get into that in a few more slides here. But common sources or origins of sepsis. So pulmonary or lung infections, right? Um, you know, everyone, I hope everyone is aware of, of COVID-19, um, which is predominantly a respiratory tract or a pulmonary or lung infection infectious process that uh, it affects the lungs specifically. Um, other forms of pneumosepsis, pneumo, a uh, medical term for things to do with the lungs. So pneumosepsis is a sepsis that began in the lungs. Um, you know, other common forms of pneumosepsis are just general pneumonias, influenza, um, other coronaviruses, right? Uh, genitourinary urinary infections or urinary tract infections. And this is actually, this is a sequenced list. These first three are the three most common in order things that cause sepsis. The most common thing that will cause sepsis is pulmonary lung infection. Uh, the second most common thing is a UTI. I actually thought those two were the other way around, but there you go. Um, so UTIs, um, I'm sure that at least a reasonable number of folks watching tonight will have experienced the UTI. They're really not that pleasant. Um, Women are significantly, and biologically female is perhaps a better way to put that, pardon me. Um, biologically female people are significantly more prone to UTIs than men simply because there is a shorter distance between the external exit of the, or external opening of the urethra <coughs> and the bladder itself. It's less physical distance for a pathogen to transmit itself across. So we do see more UTIs in women than men, or biologically female people than men. Um, much more common in the elderly as well, by the way. Um, there's a whole bunch of different reasons that I can think of why that might be the case, but I wasn't able to find any information on that definitively covered that. So, um, Gastrointestinal infection. So you can actually get sepsis, and it's actually fairly common to get sepsis um, from GI tract infections as well. And again, this came from uh, some academic sources. This is not something that I had at the top of my list of things that I would worry about or think of as loci of, of septic infections, but there you go. Um, and last, and I've thrown point number four on the here. This is actually normally significantly farther down the list, but we see this a lot in pre-hospital environments, is integumentary compromise and deep wounds. Uh, for example, abscess is secondary to drug use. Uh, I'm not sure about the other St. John uh, groups on the island, but uh, certainly here in Victoria, we traditionally run a couple of street clinics um, every week until very recently at least. Um, and we actually deal with a, a very large number of people who have uh, abscesses, so infected pustules, um, often deep within their tissue, um, who have those secondary to IV drug use um, and unfortunately living in very unhygienic environments, living on the street, living in shelters, stuff like that. So that's actually in terms of what Division 176 sees, uh, we certainly have cared for people who've been septic, secondary to wound infections before. Um, so simple infections. Simple infections, we talked a little bit about the simple infections can be wounds, you know, you get a scrape, you get some dirt in there, you don't do a great job of cleaning it, or you have, you know, those other first aid guys who don't really clean it, they just slap a band-aid on it and it gets some infection in it. Um, it might get red, it might get hot, it might get a little bit pussy, have some purulent discharge. Uh, hopefully things will resolve on their own, but they might not. Uh, cough, cold, flu, we've talked about this. Urinary tract infection, we've talked about this gastrointestinal sepsis, we talked about this, and so on and so forth, right? These are all simple infections. These are all things where very often people who are young, people who are healthy, people who don't have other underlying pathologies will, will suffer from these things and they'll get better on their own, right? Most of us have had a cough, cold, flu. Most of us have had, uh, um, you know, an infected wound. Um, 
so what are the stages of sepsis? So we've got this infected wound. Well, I'm going to say wound because it's an easy one because it's probably the thing we see most commonly. <coughs> right. Um, but what, what are the stages of a progression from an infected wound into sepsis, into septic shock, into severe, into sepsis, severe sepsis, septic shock, and refractory septic shock? Uh, well, the first thing that normally happens when an infection starts to get out of control uh, is we get something called the systemic inflammatory response. We're going to talk about these different categories in a second as we move forward. Um, we get a systemic inflammatory response, which means your infection has actually moved from affecting just a local area to affecting larger parts of the body, and you get a systemic body-wide or a system-wide response. There are things that can cause systemic inflammatory response that are not infection, that are not sepsis. We're not going to talk about those tonight. It's just important for you to know that systemic inflammatory responses do not only come from sepsis or pardon me, do not only come from infection. Um, there are other things like autoimmune disorders that can cause systemic inflammatory responses as well. Tonight we're talking about only infectious pathologies. Um, after systemic inflammatory response comes early stage sepsis, straight up sepsis, right? when your body is starting to really struggle to maintain its control of the infection. We go from sepsis to severe sepsis. These are actual, like, these are stratified categories as defined in the medical literature, by the way. This is not me freelancing and stuff. Uh, severe sepsis, septic shock. Septic shock, again, we're going to talk about the, the delineation of these things, but septic shock is when you actually start to go into a shock state or a hypoperfusive state um, secondary to your sepsis. Refractory septic shock can probably be uh, accurately defined as end-stage sepsis, right? Very bad things happen. That's all, uh, that's all from Gower's definition. So um, a systemic inflammatory response. Systemic inflammatory response. More big words. Systemic, whole system, inflammatory, inflamed, um, and response in response to a pathogenic infection, right? We define a systemic inflammatory response as being one or more of these things, right? Hyperthermia, greater than 38.5 degrees Celsius, hyper, too hot. Hypothermia, below 35 degrees Celsius. Um, anecdotally, uh, hypothermia, especially in response to um, to sepsis or infection is significantly less common, like way less common uh, than uh, than hyperthermia. I uh, I don't have the number handy, but uh, um, hypothermic or cold sepsis is is generally associated with significantly worse outcomes than uh, than febrile sepsis. Uh, altered mental status, so. You know, we, we talk about this a lot in the first aid world, um, but, but anything that alters someone's mental status is a good indication that something fairly significant is going wrong, whether it's an infection or something else. Um, in the context of a systemic inflammatory response, when we're talking about infections, altered mental status is probably a very bad thing. Tachycardia, greater than 90 beats a minute, right? And it's, again, uh, the usual warnings. This does not mean tachycardia after someone just finished running a marathon. The guy that just finished running the Royal Victoria Marathon in 2021, after it's been started back up again, um, who has a heart rate of 120, uh, is not necessarily having a systemic inflammatory response. His heart's just beating really fast because he finished running a race, right? So this is a resting heart rate greater than 90. A, a resting respiratory rate, the same caveat goes, a resting respiratory rate of greater than 20 breaths per minute. Um, and this is, this is, I throw this in here because, again, we have a lot of folks who have, uh, who have EMR or PCP licenses who are taking this information out into their, their clinical practice with other agencies. But uh, hyperglycemia greater than 6.7 millimoles uh, per liter in the absence of diabetes. So high sugars with no good reason for the sugars to be high uh, is, is actually a textbook uh, characteristic of a systemic inflammatory response. Uh, there are some other non-clinical lab criteria that uh, we're not going to talk about, but if you have access to blood work and you can uh, do creatinase levels and all that sort of thing, um, there are some other things that will be indicative of an SIR as well. So 
that's a whole bunch of stuff. Now, if you're going through your patient, you're trying to provide your patient care and you're trying to remember all this stuff, that's a lot of stuff to try and remember, um, you know, to, to, to be aware of, to have your little antenna up, to, to be thinking about, you know, does my patient meet any of these criteria and stuff. So this is other tool called QSOFA. And QSOFA is the Quick Sequential Organ Failure Assessment. Um, this is basically just a fast way of determining risk stratification of septic patients. So you've got this person, you think they've got an infection, you're trying to figure out is this a really big deal or not a big deal. Um, you know, the SIRS screening that we just talked about, right, more in depth, but has more false positives. So there's lots of other things that'll, that'll look like a systemic inflammatory response that might be something different. Um, QSOF is pretty straightforward. Does the person have altered mental status, an elevated respiratory rate while at rest, or low blood pressure, right? Low blood pressure is actually starting to edge us more towards, um, more towards uh, a sepsis than SIRS category. But SIRS screening is uh, more likely to detect sepsis before they develop QSOF criteria, right? Um, and SIRS screening is also more likely to have more false positives. Again, we're going to talk about what you do with those, those positive, those people who meet these criteria in a few minutes. So sepsis criteria, what's the difference? When do we start to go, okay, well, you might have a systemic inflammatory, or you've got this like reaction to your infection. When do we start to think that actually meets criteria to be sepsis? Well, if you've got two or more SERS signs that are new to the patient, and it's important, two or more, and new to the patient, those are both really, really important. Um, that's why they're bolded and underlined, hint, 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 it's on the test later. Um, if you've got two or more SIRS signs that are new to the patient, and you also have a suspicion or a known diagnosis of a new infection, and this is really, really important, right? Um, as I go back here, oops. way too far back, sorry about that guys. Right, so you can have all of this stuff going on or a bunch of this stuff going on, but if you have no reason to think the patient's got an infection, you sort of have to have your mind open to, to other causes for this stuff. Maybe the guy just finished running a marathon. Maybe they're emotionally stressed out, which is why their heart rate and their breathing rate's up. Um, you know, maybe they have undiagnosed diabetes, who knows, right? But Suspicion or diagnosis of a new infection with a couple of those SIRS signs, pretty good indication that, that we should treat this patient as if they're septic. Um, what do we mean by suspicion or diagnosis of a new infection? Well, you know, this is where your history taking and going back to those, uh, those common loci of sepsis can be really, really helpful. So go back and, you know, ask your history questions. Have you had a recent cough, cold, flu? Have you been around anyone who's had a recent cough, cold, flu? Have you been feeling more short of breath lately? Um, have you ever had a UTI before? Does it feel like you have a UTI now? Uh, oh, you don't know what a UTI is? Okay, do you find yourself going pee more often? Do you find yourself really needing to go to the toilet very frequently? Do you have any discomfort, any burning sensations when you do? No. Okay. Have you had any bowel changes lately? Any abdominal discomfort? Any unexplained diarrhea, nausea, vomiting? Uh, no. Okay. Do you have any new wounds on you or anything that you think might be an infected abscess or an infected cut? Oh, you do. Oh, you've got this, you know, golf ball size infected abscess in your left antecubital region. Well, you know, maybe we start to roll down a sepsis criteria instead of uh, instead of something else, right? So a, a lot of nuance, a lot of uh, a lot of the art of medicine um, in trying to tease some of this information out. But um, so we've got sepsis. What's our next criteria? Our next thing up, sepsis. If if unmanaged, if unregulated, becomes severe sepsis. Uh, severe sepsis is sepsis plus one or more of the following signs of organ dysfunction, hypertension, hip tension. Clearly I did not proofread these slides well enough. Uh, signs of organ dysfunction, hypotension or hypoperfusion, right? So areas of mottled skin, areas of mottled skin is actually, uh, um, generally speaking, a fairly significant indicator of very severe sepsis, more commonly presents in the legs. But if you've got someone 
who for, for whatever reason you're able to actually visualize their legs, this might not be appropriate in a first aid setting. But if they're telling you they've got this infected abscess from their IV drug use, they've had a fever for a couple of days, they're breathing a bit fast, their heart rate's a little bit up, um, you know, things that, that we might want to be aware of um, are that they might have some significant modeling of their skin, which can indicate impaired perfusion. Now, these folks probably aren't going to be up and walking about at this point, but at the same time, we do get called, uh, you know, when we're, when we're working those duties sometimes down at the shelters and stuff, we do sometimes get called to go and see so-and-so who's been sitting on the sidewalk for two days and hasn't got up. Well, guess what? Maybe that's why he didn't get up. Um, hypotension. Hypotension, uh, you know, a, a blood pressure of less than six, 90 over 60, below 90 systolic over 60 diastolic, it's in millimeters of mercury, of course, um, or mean arterial pressure below 65. Uh, we don't really deal with mean arterial pressures, um, but for those of us uh, outside the organization or who do deal with MAPs outside of St. John, a MAP below 65 is considered to be uh, hypotension as well. Um, areas of mottled skin uh, or capillary refill greater than three seconds. So you can't see mottled skin, um, but you can see cap refill is delayed, right? Um, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome, we're all seeing a lot of this with, with COVID right now or acute lung injury can be an indication that there is a severe sepsis. Cardiac dysfunction, you know, if it's not been somehow covered by the modeling, the hypoperfusion, the hypotension, the delayed capillary refill. There's other cardiac dysfunction that you're suspecting for whatever reason. Um, and uh, you know this is a bit harder for us to tease out, but acute renal failure as defined by a low urine output for several hours. Um, it's gonna be pretty tough for us to see this in the field, but if someone says, uh, you know, I haven't peed in four days, uh, or I haven't peed in, in a day or two, even, uh, you know, that is a clinically relevant tidbit of information that you should try and, and try and keep track of, try and remember, um, as it might help go towards building a case for or against or whatever, um, you know, meeting severe sepsis criteria. Um, we have listed on the, uh, on the list there, we have septic shock and refractory septic shock. Those are both diagnosed in hospital, so I'm not going to go over the, the details of those. Um, they do depend, they're diagnosed in a way that's dependent on the patient's response to treatment. So someone who's got septic shock or, or pardon me, sepsis or severe sepsis, um, they'll go off and into ICU, they'll receive a whole bunch of fluids and uh, you know, whatever, a handful of different medications that may be appropriate and how well they respond to that will often uh, or will be what dictates whether they meet septic shock or refractory septic shock criteria. Um, you know, in refractory septic shock, we're talking about patients that need to be put on uh, IV drips of vasopressors to keep their blood pressure high enough to keep them alive, right? Not something that we're going to be able to determine or, uh, or differentiate in the field in any kind of meaningful way. So how do we manage these folks? Uh, does this, is this actually, this might be a good, uh, a good pause moment for just a second. Anna, do we have any questions that I want to go back and address right now, or am I going to keep going for a bit? You're still on mute, Anna. Oh, there you are. Okay. Uh, we had a few questions and there was a bit of discussion going on uh, in the chat, but um, for maybe those who didn't see what was being asked, we can pause and cover them right now. Is there, is there anything that, that looks like it would be beneficial if I go back and deal with it now, or should I just keep forging ahead? I've only got five or six more slides and then we'll have time for questions. I just didn't want to, um, talking about differentiation and management, I wanted to make sure that there weren't any like fundamental questions. Before we, um, we, we were just asking about COVID in relation to sepsis of the you know, lung infection, but uh, you said you're covering that later. Sure. Well, well, we'll talk about COVID afterwards. COVID is not broadly speaking a septic process necessarily. It's an ARDS process, but um, I think all the other questions can wait. I think that was the most pressing one. Okay. Anna, you're good with that? Yep. Okay. Fantastic. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -da. Okay. So what do we do with patients? We think, we think we've got someone who is uh, septic. They don't just have a simple infection. We think that they, they are septic. They've come up to us at a first aid post. They've asked for an assessment. We've said, oh, hey, you meet some of those sepsis criteria. 
we think we've got a locus of infection, you've got a bit of a fever, you've, uh, you know, you've, you've complained about these changes in your urinary habits for the last few days, and your heart rate's up to 90 for no good reason. We think you're a little bit septic. What do we do with you? Well, believe it or not, history taking and symptom management are really about all we can do. And there's not a lot for symptom management unless they have a respiratory complaint. Um, so recognition uh, that this is actually something that needs to be transferred to higher level care is probably the most valuable thing that, that first aiders can provide uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, making a decision about like, oh, well, it was nice to see you. Have a great day. Thanks for coming by the first aid post. We put a Band-Aid on you or whatever. We put a splint on your sprained wrist or whatever. Um, you know, recognizing that, that people who are starting to, to toe the line into a septic state need to go and see a physician, uh, you know, prior to COVID, preferably at the emergency department. Now we might want to try and find alternate pathways. Um, but that recognition is probably the biggest thing that we can actually do for them. Um, secondary to that, accurate and detailed history taking is of crucial importance. And not only do we want to be able to recognize why we think this person needs to go and see a higher level of care to possibly get some IV antibiotics or whatever, um, but we need to make sure that we understand that the next clinician that speaks to them might not be as astute as we are. They might not have their ears tweaked in just the right way to recognize why we thought this was a sepsis or why we thought this was an uncontrolled infection. Um, so we want to make sure that we do really accurate, and really detailed history taking and really highlight the things that are that made us think that this person might meet sepsis criteria to begin with uh, and make sure that that information is charted in detail and very specifically in our PCRs uh, so that when that PCR does end up in the hands of the next clinician along, whether that's the, uh, uh, you know, whether that's a family doctor, a walk-in clinic, a teleconference doctor on, uh, you know, one of these new phone apps or something else or an emergency physician, um, that they have a good way of understanding why they thought, uh, why we thought the way we did. In terms of clinical management, uh, it's really treat what you got. Treat symptoms as you see them, right? Do make sure you consider other causes as well as sepsis, right? Don't, as with anything, you know, we're trying to differentiate between this, you know, the various things that could have gone wrong with someone as they walked in, um, you know, walked into the first aid tent. Uh, you know, in, in the middle of July, the patient who walks in with a temperature of 38.5 degrees, a heart rate of 100, uh, and a blood pressure of, of 90 on 20, no, 90 on 60 or whatever. Um, you know, if it's a hot day out, we need to be able to differentiate between is this likely a hyperthermic patient with an environmental hyperthermia or is this possibly a septic patient? Um, you know, that's when our history taking and our ability to actually look at their history and determine if there's a likely locus of infection or not becomes really important. Um, hypoxic or short of breath patients should get oxygen. Uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, hypoxic or short of breath patients should get oxygen. Uh, we unfortunately currently don't have access to pulse oximetry at St. John. Uh, for folks who do have access to pulse oximetry, obviously titrate to reasonable levels and consider your differentials uh, based on what those are looking like. Um, and uh, hypotensive patients, if, if your patient is hypotensive, uh, should be placed supine or semi-sitting in a position of comfort, you know, make things easy for them. Uh, and I didn't actually put this on a bullet point because I, I felt like it probably was, uh, was left unsaid, but, um, you know, do act appropriately to get these people to a higher level of medical care. If they're meeting what you think are septic criteria, um, you know, ambulance is not an unreasonable way to go to hospital. Uh, if they're able to go with their friend and just go to the walk-in clinic and you believe they're going to go to the walk-in clinic, sure, perfectly reasonable. It's a great thing to do. If you don't believe they're going to do it today, well, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, you might have to try and talk them into accepting an ambulance ride um, or taking themselves to the eMERGE or whatever. Um, I have a slide for sources and references here. Um, this is about as complete as I could make it. Um, I'm going to leave that up just for a couple seconds in case anyone wants to pause it or screen grab it or whatever. And uh, questions, sepsis questions first, COVID-19 questions after. So does anyone have, oh, we have a little, why do we have this little, someone's been annotating this again, clear. <laughs> 
eraser. It's a little thin there. Um, Anna, you're still on mute. Okay, we'll start with the questions that came from the chat and then afterwards, everyone, um, there's a bar down below and it allows you to send a little hand waving icon. So if you'd like to um, ask a question and not type it, we can do that afterwards. But we'll start with these, there were a few. I'll start with the one that was just asked. Um, someone's asking if someone is kind of walks into the tent, they're walking, talking, but you're thinking there's some sort of septic process at play, mm -hmm. do we send them or advise them to go to a merge or can this person go to a walk-in clinic for treatment? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, it would depend a lot on, uh, Depends a lot on on really what you think is actually wrong with the person and how how capable they are of you know of, of moving themselves. And you know, I, I assume when we say go to a merge, we're talking about driving themselves um, as opposed to being unable to get themselves there. In which case, we're calling an ambulance for them. Um, you know, if, if they go to a walk-in clinic, there's a very good likelihood that they're going to be sent somewhere else to uh, go and get some blood work drawn. If the walk-in clinic is not able to do blood work on their own, which most of them cannot. Um, but most of them are located, most walking clinics are located somewhat reasonably conveniently close to a lab service, either Life Labs or I don't know if there's other lab services around, uh, you know, that, that I'm not aware of, starting with Life Labs. Um, you know, uh, is it 10 o'clock on a Sunday night? Well, guess what? The walk-in clinic's closed and Life Labs is closed. And we probably don't want to leave this person just brewing their infection overnight. Um, if it's someone with very mild symptoms and they're an otherwise healthy individual, yeah, sure. Do you feel so uncomfortable you can't make it through the night? Well, no, you might want to head up to the ER then and see if they can get you some symptom relief and some management. If it's an 80 year old who's got a fever, uh, no, I'm sorry. We're probably even going to call an ambulance and send you up to the hospital right now or get your husband or wife or whoever to take you up. Um, so you know it, it does vary case by case but um and you know a little bit depending on, on what resources are available to you locally all right um another question was why do we see increased respirations with sepsis what is going on in the body to cause that oh excellent question metabolic acidosis my favorite thing <laughs> um kind of is actually my favorite thing. there's a really cool process so um, as your body's infectious process, uh, or as the infectious process within your body worsens, um, your body starts to, depending on how your metabolism is starting to malfunction, uh, will very, very often start to uh, produce more carbon dioxide secondary to the way it's using energy, and using it as an adenosine triphosphate within your cells. Um, and we're not going to go really down a Krebs cycle talk right now because that's Nobody wants that, especially not me. You don't want that either, trust me. Um, but the short version is your cells start to use energy in a way that creates more carbon dioxide. When you have more carbon dioxide, your body has to get rid of it. And to get rid of it, your body has to breathe faster to breathe out the carbon dioxide. Because don't forget, that's actually what's driving your respiratory process, not the, not the lack of oxygen. Um, uh, and so you see an increased respiratory rate. Now there are in severe, severe, severe metabolic acidosis, you can also see another pathology come into play where your blood actually loses its ability to carry oxygen as effectively. Uh, and in those cases, uh, yeah, you know, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis is a good example. Like severe DKA is a really good example of this. Um, uh, in those cases, you will actually see someone breathing faster also because they need to move more oxygen as well. But primarily it's just because they're trying to blow off their extra CO2. <clears throat> and this person has further asked, are you going to see Kussmaul respirations? Uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily expect that. Normally you'll just see an elevated respirate. Um, I'd have to go and I'd have to go and dig into the literature a little bit to answer if you actually do see Kussmaul respirations in septic patients. I would expect that would be a late stage, end stage sign because you need to be significantly acidotic to drive that if it would even do that. 
Cool. That was a good question. <laughs> that was a very good question. Yeah. Um, another one was about diabetes. So this person was asking if someone has diabetes um, and they have foot or leg wounds that we mm -hmm. see with diabetic patients, are they more at risk for sepsis? Or could we see sepsis with these leg wounds? Absolutely. I'm trying to find a photo here. I have to do this on my phone because I can't. Here's for anyone who can see. Here's Wilfred Brimley. He's required to be present for any mention of the diabetes. Um, but um, but yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the 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 reason that we see more frequent um, the the reason that we see more frequent leg wounds in diabetic patients is, is sort of two threefold. Um, but but you know, diabetic patients will have impaired peripheral circulation, impaired oxygenation. Because of the impaired circulation, the impaired oxygenation, they have impaired healing capacity, um, so they're more prone to infections. Um, and they also have very often peripheral neuropathy, which means they're not going to feel the, the diabetic ulcers on their feet to begin with. Um, and so they might not recognize the early signs of a wound and deal with it early and stuff. So all those things make them more predisposed to having, uh, having wounds that can be long-standing ulcers. It is possible for someone to have an ulcerated wound that is not infected. You can have a clean ulcerated wound that is just failing to heal because of other pathologies. Um, but if it does get infected, um, absolutely, it's going to progress or could progress, very likely progress to a sepsis. And we do see people with diabetes. Uh, I'm going to freelance this question a little bit. I, I'm about 80, 90 percent sure that people with diabetes are going to be more prone to developing a septic disease process um, than others. I can't, can't imagine why they wouldn't. So. I get a thumbs up from Anna. Yeah. Um, and then um, this question was asked pretty early on. Are we worried or are we first worried with sepsis when it comes to COVID-19? Uh, I don't know if you want to touch on this one now or. Sure. Let, 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 let's, let's go into this now. So, so um, you know, my understanding, for, first off, I, I am not a physician. I am not a microbiologist or biochemist. I'm not a pulmonologist, I'm not an RT, I'm a paramedic. Um, but my understanding of the COVID disease process, the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID-19, is that it effectively causes a, a, a scarring and mucus growth within the lungs that mechanically interferes with actual pulmonary respiration. So the main process that it's killing people with primarily, and I was, I was just reading about this half an hour ago, an hour ago, uh, the main process that it's killing people with is not actually a septic process. It's actually physically blocking oxygen transfer from the alveoli into the bloodstream and by proxy also blocking carbon dioxide from leaving the bloodstream and being taken out of the body. And between those two things, um, you end up with what's called a respiratory acidosis because you've got a relative acidosis in the bloodstream that is not uh, that is being caused by respiratory impairment, uh, and you've got a relative hypoxia, a pulmonary hypoxia, um, and you know a, a diminished amount of oxygen in the bloodstream, which results in also a hypoxemia, which results in diminished oxygen delivery to cells. That ends up causing multiple organ failure. Normally, the first organs to fail or begin to fail with reduced oxygen supply within the bloodstream are the brain and the kidneys. Now, your brain, you start to lose consciousness, you become confused, disoriented, all this other stuff happens with acidosis as well. So between the hypoxia and the acidosis, you got a hypoxemic brain, that's a problem. Um, but you can kind of like, your brain can kind of handle that for, for periods of time. And there's, you know, not good, but not catastrophic side effects to that. Um, you know, the, the flip side of that is when you start having, or not the flip side, but the second stage of that is when you start having hypoxic kidneys. Um, and your kidneys stop being able to do the job and remove all of the other toxins from your bloodstream, that's when you start to have really significant problems. So that's my understanding. And again, um, you know, I'm a PCP. I'm not a pulmonologist. I'm not a microbiologist. I'm not any of these other fancy things. But that's my understanding of the, the, the pathophys of the COVID-19 disease process. Um, you know, ask again in a week and science in general might know more. But certainly that's, that's the understanding that I'm aware of right now. So not septic. Cool. 
Uh, those were all the questions from the chat that I kind of caught. There was a bunch of discussion in there and some questions got answered. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other questions or comments. You can either raise your hand. I think you also have the power to unmute yourself and just ask your questions. So we can uh -oh. go do that now. Come on, questions, questions. I haven't had anyone to talk to except Anna for weeks. Hell, wow. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, Someone was asking why uh, infection will grow in blood, like uh, whether it's sugars in blood, and I know there's like fats and proteins. Is uh, anything that makes blood more attractive? Why an infection will grow in blood? I, I, I'm not sure how to respond to that because infections will grow in any kind of tissue and they'll be carried by blood to other things. Um, Just wondering if there's anything especially attractive about blood, like its proteins or its sugars or its fats or its structure or anything that would make it more attractive or less. So Nick, just to jump in for a sec here, yeah. I think the question was more related to uh, diabetics. So if like the increased um, sugar levels in diabetic blood is more likely to cause transmission and replication of viruses versus... Um, I think it's a lowered immune system in diabetics as well. Sure. So, uh, you know, a diminished immune system, first off, uh, interesting question. Um, uh, you know, a, a diminished immune capacity is going to predispose any tissue type to infection and infectious growth. Um, you, to answer the question of whether or not you would get infectious growth in the bloodstream itself, I, you'd have to ask a hematologist, to be honest. Um, I, I don't have a great, I don't have a great answer for you on that. It's certainly not uh, it's certainly not something that, that is in the realm of what I would be thinking about in terms of pre-hospital assessment or management of someone. Um, you know, I mean, there, there is a process called septicemia, which is, you know, it's, it's kind of an older term, but we talk about a blood infection, but that's more commonly used in the context of people talking about infection that simply becomes systemic and affecting multiple organ systems um, rather than infecting the blood itself. Um, there are also infectious processes that target specifically blood, but uh, again, you'd, you'd have to ask an infectious disease or a disease specialist or a hematologist to, to get a better answer than I can give you. I'm sorry. Okay. Someone is asking, what about meningitis and sepsis? Oh, also a thing that you would have to ask <laughs> someone else about, unfortunately. Um, meningitis, for those of you guys who don't know, meningitis is uh, a, an infection of the meninges, which is the layer, uh, the, the outer lining of the brain, and meningitis can cause uh, uh, a whole bunch of really, really bad things, as you can imagine, anything that, that infects the brain, or affects the brain, or infects the brain. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the disease process that meningitis follows to, to possibly turn into sepsis versus being a direct pathology that's impacting the brain and causing its damage there, I don't know. Again, uh, whether this is a thing that affects directly that organ system, like, or whether this is something that proceeds or progresses to a broader sepsis, I couldn't answer that for you. I'm sorry. Uh, hold on, I've got a couple of questions coming up here that I'm trying to catch up on. Um, scroll, sorry guys. Someone was um, asking if there's any particular organs that are a better or worse prognosis for infection. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's a great question. We sort of covered that. I'm just gonna zip back here. Da, 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 da. Nope, passed it. So uh, common sources of origin for sepsis. So these are the organs that we'll see most commonly uh, being at the root of infections that end up becoming septic. So uh, the pulmonary system, the lungs, right? Or the, the broader respiratory tract. Um, genital urinary infections. So, you know, that would be everything from the urethra, the bladder, um, the ureters, the kidneys, um, that sort of whole train there. Uh, the gastrointestinal tract, and again, which specific areas of the gastrointestinal tract, you'd have to ask a gastroenterologist, they couldn't tell you. Uh, 
Um, but you know, I mean, the GI tract covers really everything from your mouth to your anus and everything in between. Um, and you know, certainly again, in the context of what we're more likely to see on St. John duties, at least down here in Victoria, um, you know, deep wound abscesses, uh, secondary to IV drug use is a very, very common one. That's probably the most frequent thing that I think we see in the field here. Um, you know, in terms of other organs, um, what's not part of the lungs, the genital urinary, the gastrointestinal tract. I mean, I, you know, I suppose pancreatic infection or something could you could or liver infection you could probably you know liver's kind of tied into the GI tract fine but you could you could probably find some sort of infectious loci in those organs as well but um you know i think that stuff covers the majority of what we see or a large portion of it certainly the most common things um so i think to elaborate on that question um this person is asking, so would something like lung infections be more likely to become septic just because infections are common there? Um, so so whether, some, whether an infection develops into a sepsis is really going to be dependent on a whole bunch of things, not, you know, which specific organ is involved is probably fairly far down the list. Um, you know, people have infections in all of these organ systems quite regularly, quite routinely. Most of us just are just absolutely fine and dandy with them. Um, things that will determine whether an infection becomes septic are A, the specific pathogen that's involved, um, whether we have a good immune response to it, whether we have immune impairment to it, or Im immune impairment, pardon me, um, that, that prevents our body's immune system from dealing with that infection well. Um, and also, uh, you know, other, other comorbidities or co-pathologies that we might be suffering from at the time. Um, you know, certainly elderly and frail and infirm people are significantly more prone to sepsis than otherwise young, healthy people. Um, you know, if you've, if you've got the same pathogen that, uh, that infects someone's urinary tract in a 20-year-old and an 85-year-old, the 20 year old's probably gonna have some burning when they pee for a few weeks and may or may not go see the doctor. It may or may not resolve spontaneously. You might have to go get some anti-oral antibiotics and they're probably gonna be fine. That same infection, that same pathogen in the 85 year old might well kill them. Um, you know, I, I quite routinely see uh, elderly folks literally die of UTIs. Um, whereas, you know, this is not an uncommon occurrence for people in their 20s or 30s. So. Um, in terms of specific organs that are more likely to develop into sepsis, uh, nothing's jumping to mind. But in terms of uh, um, in terms of age and other factors, absolutely. I'm just going to turn a light on while I'll get the next question ready here. Sure, that was a that was a good question. Um, going down the list, we have: Are smokers more prone to sepsis? I would assume so. I don't have that information directly in front of me. Um, people who have a history of smoking are absolutely more prone to other pulmonary disease and they are more prone to pulmonary infection. The reason they're more prone to pulmonary infection is because the smoking actually destroys all the cilia in the respiratory tract that helps move gunk and infectious processes out of the lungs. The hot smoke basically singes, burns, and destroys all those cilia, um, which leaves your lungs far more prone to infection. If people are getting more frequently infected with things, it stands to reason that, uh, you know, if 5% if of all lung infections or 1% of all lung infections develop into sepsis, it, it stands to reason that if more smokers get lung infections to begin with, more smokers would develop sepsis secondary to that. But um, I don't have hard data in front of me on that. Um, if you look at the chat, Nick, there's a few uh, answers to that as well. Uh, smokers are known for poor healing, probably microvascular impairment. And then next person adds that nicotine is a vasoconstrictor that reduces fine healing. Sure. Yeah. All, all great answers. I, uh, um, you know, there's, there's a question about whether we're talking about as well current smokers versus past smokers. Um, just off the top of my head, there's very few things that smoking doesn't make worse. So, <laughs> so you know, as a general rule, you could, if, if the question's being asked, does smoking make thing X worse? The answer is probably yes. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, 
um, bone growth is double in smokers or fracture healing. Oh, yeah, I guess that means length of, of healing. I didn't. I don't think it's quite double, but um, you know, it's certainly you know things that would be increased. That doesn't. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, Anna, I don't know if yeah, sorry, I'm just catching up on that. I actually didn't have a chat window open, so I don't know if you've been catching the. Uh, yeah, um, there was there was a lot of conversation. I th I think I caught a bunch of it. If I missed anything, speak up. I think you guys have the power to unmute yourself as well, so you can just tune in and and chat. <laughs> Mike, I approve of your input. <laughs> All right. Turn into cartilage and into bone and osteoblasts are stunned by nicotine. Um, oh, here's Mike. Did you want me to unmute you there, Mike? Because I can. Let's unmute Mike. I'm trying. He's fighting it. <laughs> uh, I'm oh. unmuting myself. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting in a nice lounge chair as it turns out much more comfortable than the classroom. <laughs> No, I just put a thumb, uh, a raised thumb up. It wasn't a hand raised. Oh, sorry. Oh, that was a thumbs up versus a hand raise. Okay. <laughs> it's, still, it's still lovely to chat, chat to you, Mike. I don't actually see a hand raise on my screen. There's a, there's a hand clapping. We can call um, that the wave for attention. Sure. Uh, oh, there's a thumbs up. There we go. There we go. Uh, Okay, I'll mute you again. Um, any other any other questions here, guys? Before we before we pack it in for the uh, for the evening. Any other questions, queries, comments? Uh, hand raises on the participant screen, so I don't think I see it. But, um, I don't know if you wanted to touch on any of the COVID stuff that was coming up. Um. Are there specific questions about COVID? Like, I mean, I, you know, I'm not sure that's a big, that's a big topic. And again, I'm not going to go and dig through the whole chat log right now. No, there was a question, like totally unrelated to sepsis and infection. Someone was curious about wearing masks in your day to day life. Right. That's a great question that was addressed by the uh, public health officer of Canada, or chief health officer of Canada today. Um, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, and also I believe by Dr. Von Henry. Um, so uh, really short version is that mask use is actually really, really complicated. And I think uh, a lot of people don't appreciate how complicated, uh, you know, the, the whole process of selecting what kind of respiratory protection to wear and for what and who the respiratory protection is protecting is really fantastically understood uh, by a lot of folks. Um, really short version. I'll try and make this really short. Uh, COVID, to the best of our knowledge, COVID or SARS-CoV-2 is, uh, is transmitted primarily via droplets. Droplets are really big, uh, relatively speaking, relative to aerosols. Uh, actual droplets of fluid that come out of your mouth when you're wandering around, you're breathing, you're talking, whatever. If you've ever stood next to someone like a little bit too close and you get that, that spray on the face, um, that, uh, that's droplet transmission. Um, COVID is primarily transmitted by droplets to the best of our knowledge. And again, this is with the caveat that A, I'm a paramedic and B, this is all changing every couple of days. But right now we understand COVID uh, in day-to-day -day incidental exposure, COVID is transmitted by droplets. Um, if someone is having a coughing fit or doing other things that will generate aerosols, so other things that can generate aerosols include having CPR done on them, being ventilated with a BVM, being intubated or having other advice, uh, um, uh, other advanced airways, pardon me, put in. Um, they might be generating aerosols. Surgical masks, and they're, sorry, pardon me, I should clarify that as well. Aerosols are really, really, really tiny droplets. They're like orders of magnitude smaller than the droplet protection. Um, I'm reading some 200 million viruses, 100 microns, cough equals. I'm, I'm not sure where you're getting those numbers from, uh, 
M Ashton 1054. Um, yeah, I, I'd be very cautious about throwing at, throwing specific numbers at this because there's a lot of variables. Yeah, so uh, if, if you're getting stuff from the MFR textbook, I'd encourage you to find a primary source, uh, not just the MFR textbook. Uh, the MFR textbook is, is a great resource for, for the MFR program and the MFR course, um, but unless it's actually citing peer-reviewed research, I'd be very cautious about, about um, just pulling numbers straight from that. Um, so as I was saying, uh, depending on what type of mask you're wearing, surgical masks will protect against droplet reasonably well, unless you're in a turbulent air environment like the back of an ambulance. Uh, N95 masks will present, prevent, pardon me, protect against uh, aerosolized uh, pathogens. Um, the catch is that N95s, to know they're effective, a significant portion of the population doesn't actually have a face that will fit an N95 mask especially well. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why we, in healthcare, we actually fit test on N95s, and we actually have to fit test uh, at least, at minimum, once a year um, um, because our faces can change shape. So, you know, in terms of wearing masks in public, um, you know, wearing a surgical mask in public might protect you from other people who are, are spreading droplets around. That's the some of the reasoning. Might is the key word there. Might, right? Um, N95 masks are completely ridiculous unless you're hanging around uh, people who are undergoing aerosolizing medical procedures, aerosol generating medical procedures. What a surgical mask will do is they will um, they will uh, prevent the droplets that you're spewing out of your mouth when you're an asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic carrier transmitter. They will stop you from getting other people sick. Um, I see someone's just private message me here that some people are using masks to remind them not to touch their faces. One reason people are using homemade ineffective protection masks. Sure, and if that's a if that's a way to help remind you to not touch your face. Um, then that's, uh, um, you know, that, that's great. Um, the reason that, that much caution has been given around advice about homemade masks is because the fabric that homemade masks are, uh, are made of is by definition a fabric of opportunity. It's like whatever you've got around that you decided to make a mask with, it might let droplets through, who knows? It might, let uh, it might let aerosol probably will let aerosol through no matter what um, you know we don't we don't really know are you making a mask out of uh, reused flannel pajamas are you making it out of silk are you out of making it out of some kind of medical grade fat like who knows and so this idea that fabric is fabric is fabric and we can make masks out of fabric is, is not conducive to any kind of good answer if you want to wear uh, if you want to wear a mask because it makes you feel better it's unlikely to cause harm um, and that's what I believe Dr. Henry was saying earlier today in the, the address of the province is that, you know, go ahead. It's probably not going to make anything worse. The downside to, uh, to wearing a mask is if you don't actually know how to take masks on and off properly, the same way if you don't know how to take gloves on and off properly, um, you're often going to do more damage cross-contaminating yourself um, than you are, uh, than you are giving yourself protection, right? So, um, you know, doing things, uh, doing things like you know, washing your hands immediately before taking your mask off, making sure you don't touch your face, unhooking off the ears, putting it down, or unhooking it off the back of your head, putting it down, immediately washing your hands together. Um, you know, I, I think it's unlikely that the majority of people who are wearing masks actually have the knowledge to know how to do that properly. Um, you know, in the same way with gloves, we see lots of people wandering around with gloves uh, in, uh, in many different places. And they're wearing the same pair of gloves everywhere. They're not washing their hands in between. They're cross-contaminating everything with these filthy gloves. And it's because they just don't know how to actually use medical gloves. Um, yes, I'm seeing a number of, oh my God, people with gloves in public are gross. Uh, I don't disagree with that. Um, but you know, the, the masking is the same thing. If you don't know how to use the tool properly, it's not gonna do the best job possible of protecting you. If it's a homemade device, yeah, yeah. You know, is it gonna make things worse? Probably not, but 
Um, yeah. I see some discussion about uh, about uh, mask reuse within the ambulance service and stuff as well. I'm not just because I'm not representing my uh, my employer right now. I'm not going to go into uh, any kind of great depth on that. The really short version is that the the ambulance service, as of a couple of days ago, uh, has moved to uh, extended use of masks in many circumstances. Um, in line with what the public health officer of British Columbia has directed us to do. Um, so you will see some paramedics uh, reusing masks uh, for significant periods of time. Uh, were there um, more questions? I see Mike kind of doing a hand wave, so I'm going to unmute him just in case he, he wanted to speak. Uh, yeah, I was going to unmute myself, but Nick just keeps going on and on. And on. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, first of all, what Teresa Tam said today was very good advice. Secondly, what I wanted to mention was uh, if you go to the John Hopkins site, John's Hopkins site where, where they have uh, all the displays of graphs and things, yeah. there's, uh, there's a link on there, um, just on that page uh, near the top, that takes you to an article, uh, quite a good article on, uh, on homemade masks. Not in terms of what to use, but in terms of uh, how useful they are or aren't. It's basically aren't. They're, you know, I think if I recall what Teresa Tam said, it's better if you're sick to wear a mask because you may uh, you know, keep some of the droplets from hitting other people. Yeah. But uh, you won't reduce your own risk very much if you're not sick. Yes, I, you know, and that, that's that's very much in line with my own my own understanding. Like, I think the reason that that some of this came to the forefront is because people started making all these homemade masks and contributing to, them to hospitals and all you know all this sort of thing, and and a lot of folks are really looking for just anything they can do to feel like they're helping, um, which is why. Uh, um, um, I see a, sorry, I see an interesting comment here. I'm gonna to respond to it in a second. Um, I just wanna add one more thing. I tried to get my wife to take apart the pussy hats that she made uh, three years ago. Yeah. And make pussy masks with little ears. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. That'd be fantastic. Um, I see someone, uh, the 827222RE asking, uh, I've heard using an N95, I think that's an N95, with a surgical mask over top, then delete the surgical mask or get rid of the surgical mask. Um, to me, that doesn't sound like a good idea because we know that surgical masks are permeable to aerosols. So if you're inhaling an aerosolized thing, it's going to transit through the surgical mask, contaminate the outer surface of your N95 underneath it, and then you've thrown away your surgical mask and you think you're dealing with a clean item and in fact your N95 is actually contaminated. Um, the reason that surgical masks are, are not used in all settings is because they specifically do not block aerosols. Um, yes, Anna's saying wear your face shield, absolutely. Um, this is why we have full face shields issued to us, um, certainly with the ambulance service. Uh, and, you know, uh, certainly within the hospitals right now, we're seeing the people that are going into the negative pressure rooms to, to, to care for the COVID patients are in full face shields, and that's the reason for it. Um, you know, if, if, if you want to put a surgical mask over top of your N95, I'm not going to stop you, but you should probably assume that both of them are contaminated. So there you go. That'd be my... Uh, that'd be my reasoning to it, at least. Again, in the absence of, 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 you know, a research study in front of me, I don't have a great answer for you beyond that. That doesn't make sense to me that that would provide protection. Um, other questions? Are we done? I don't think so. Um, before we before we end this session, I'd just like to invite all of you to the next one because we hope to keep this going every week until we can start meeting in person again. But next session will be taught by Dr. John Wallace and he will be covering pediatric assessments. Uh, so I will be sending out the, the, the chat, I don't know what we call this, the webinar invitation and forward it to other divisions again. So I hope all of you can join us next time. Nick, do you, do you want to say anything else? Any other questions, anyone?
I got nothing I, else. Just, oh, I, someone's talking. Go, go ahead. I'm just going to put the references up again so they're easy for people to find. Go ahead. Hi, it's, it's Liz. Can you hear me okay? Liz, Liz hello. I can hello. Hear you fine. Um, I understand that from a St. John point, um, most of our events are canceled until further notice. Is yeah. that correct? And is there any anything in the works to possibly be calling on St. John ambulance supplies should um, other supplies I, I, go? I'll, I'll answer that really, really quickly. And Anna can throw in anything else if she wants. Um, uh, there, there are some plans in the works. Um, there's significant, very significant risk mitigation in terms of doing anything with the division right now. And in terms of like actually utilizing St. John's supplies, I'm not aware of anything that I've heard of there. Oh, actually, well, there has technically been a, an, an informal discussion uh, about some stuff, but um, you know, I don't know if Anna, if you've got. Um, yeah, there's, there's planning going around and there's, I guess division and area specific projects that are coming coming down to us, so we may not be um, shut down from community services for this whole pandemic. Um, but it really depends on where you are and what's going on in your in your area. But you will be seeing emails coming out from PHQ and from your local divisions. Stay tuned. Um, David just wanted us to mention that these sessions are being recorded and we will be posting them once we process these videos and we can share the link to these afterwards. So if you ever want to go back, we'll, um, we'll make this shareable. Um, someone's asking, are supplies in hospitals adequate for now? Uh, I, I don't have, know. <laughs> I, have, I have not been at work for the last uh, 24 hours or so, uh, 36 hours, I guess, uh, pardon me. Um, certainly when I was at work in the hospitals 48 hours ago, everyone had appropriate levels of PPE on. Beyond that, I'm going to let you ask that question of uh, the Provincial Health Services Authority or the Ministry of Health because I have not got to ask or have direct information about that. Yeah, on a positive note, there was a CTV article just a few hours ago that 3M has managed to come up with a deal with the White House to keep exporting its supplies to Canada. Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> that is good. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we're kind of winding down questions. I see people leaving. So I think if anybody has anything to add, now is your chance. But otherwise, we'll wrap it up for now. Uh, keep checking your emails for the next one. I hope to send it out just as soon as I get things confirmed up with Dr. Wallace. And I'll send it on to Ross and he can disperse it through the divisions. Fantastic. Um, have a good night, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy, and hope to see you on here soon. You go on that. Stay healthy. <laughs> stay separate. <Yeah. laughs> stay home. <laughs> yeah, physical distance. <laughs> Someone's asking, are we doing takeout at Boston Pizza? <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Next time I'll bake a pizza before this and we can all eat a symbolic pizza together. <laughs> Kyla, can you send it to Ontario? I think you might have to join me in baking your own pizza. <laughs> I vote we actually mail a pizza to Kyla in Ontario. <laughs> how she feels about that plan when it arrives. Um, keep in mind that Canada Post is taking a long time with things these days. Uh, um, okay, I'm going to log out. Have a good night, guys. All Thanks right. Good night, coming. everyone. See you next time.